Welcome back to It's Down to Business with Jack Miller. Call us at 305-541-2350. Follow us on Facebook at Jack Miller Down to Business or on Twitter at HJackMiller1. You have chances to serve much more than you grab the ring on the we are super, super excited to have the globally known evangelist Jay Louder with us. Uh, Jay has been preaching the word of Christ, and I apologize if I'm getting it wrong, uh, for literally years. He's taught millions and millions of people, and what I like about Jay is he seems to go and to Go where no one wants to go, to the downtrodden and to uplift them. He's also the author of a great book called Midnight in uh, Aisle 7. Uh, Mr. Louder, I really appreciate you joining us. I can only imagine how busy you are on this Christmas Eve day. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on the show. It's a real privilege. Matter of fact, uh, I was in your neck of the woods in Miami just a couple of months ago on my way to Haiti. So you guys are in the... A bright, sunny place. Love it out there. Well, I, I hope it treated you right. <laughs> it did. It did. So you have a – I've listened to your YouTubes. You seem to be uh, just on fire. You have the Jay Louder Harvest Ministries. I know you're starting a TV show, I think. Um, but what captivated captivates me most is that you seem to – preach to the people, and I don't know if I'm using the word downtrodden, but who are somewhat down and need help. Um, And I'm curious about that, and what led you to that? Well, part of it comes from my own story. You know, I was a guy who, uh, I mean, when you want to talk about on the bottom of the barrel, I was living on unemployment. Um, I had an addiction that I couldn't break, suicidal. And so when I met Christ, I just wanted to reach people like myself who who were really struggling. And so over the years, we just made the commitment from the jump, really, that any door got open, we would walk through it. None were too big, none were too small. And when I first got started, you have to realize I didn't have a theology degree. I had not been to Bible college. And so I just wanted to use my story to leverage to reach other people. But because I didn't have any credentials, the only opportunities really I had was walking up and down the streets of my hometown among all the bars and topless clubs and the the homeless shelters. And so really that's where my ministry got launched. And then the more I studied about Christ, the more I realized that he was a friend of sinners, that he was a friend of the down and out. And in this day and time, you know, the church is waiting for unsaved people to come to them, but it's time for the church to take the gospel to the unsaved. What um what denomination, if any, uh, do you associate with within Christianity? Well, that's the great thing about what we do as an evangelist. Of course, I have my theological persuasions, but people really invite us to come to their city or their coliseum or their stadium just to preach the gospel. So we don't really have to get in theological differences. I mean, as long as it's an evangelical church that believes in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, then we can stand on common ground. All the other side issues, that's just not why people bring us in. If you're familiar with Dr. Graham, I'm certainly not putting myself in the same sentence as him, but we do what uh, the Graham organization does just on a smaller level. So we're really able to work with every mainline denomination and pretty much have. Well, that's great. Um, we're, we actually want to talk about common ground, and, and that's the holiday of Christmas, which has descended upon us as it does every year. And uh, we're very excited to have you here uh, to talk about that holiday with us. I have a question for you. You know, it seems to me that so many people today throughout the world are down, downtrodden, depressed, have problems, business problems, marital problems, just all kinds of problems. What's your message to them? How do, they, how do we help them um, to, fe- to bring some happiness in their life a- a- to those who are struggling? Along with that, maybe it's really a part two question, are we really our brother's keeper? It seems that part of the problem that I think is that we don't have as much community as we used to. And I think it's our obligation, whether you be uh, Jewish, Catholic, Muslim, Hindu, whatever, to help one another, help our brothers um, out. And it seems you're doing that. Well, I mean, when you look at the life of Christ, Jesus made it clear in Luke 19.10. If you want to look for his MO, his mission statement, it's this. I came to seek and save that which was lost. 
And if you're a believer in the Scripture, well, the Scripture, Jesus said in John 20, 21, he said, as my Father sent me, so send I you. So in essence, what he's saying is, is the mandate, the call, the responsibility, the obligation, and the privilege that he has to reach the unsaved people is what we're supposed to do. And it's important to remember that just because somebody lives in a nice home or has a good job or a beautiful wife or a handsome husband, whatever the case may be, that there are people that are hurting and struggling. It's not just the people I referenced earlier, our ministry starting on the streets right here, literally down the street from my office among the bars. But the truth of it is there are just as many people hurting on the other side of town that have big fancy homes and cosmetically look like everything is okay. So it needs to begin with a recognition that there are people who are searching for hope, and it doesn't matter what race, color, creed, financial bracket, whatever the demographic may be, people are looking for hope. And so what we're trying to do is is we found that the only permanent hope, of course you can find satisfaction temporarily in a lot of things, but the only real lasting hope comes from a personal relationship with Christ and understanding that he's forgiven you. So we've taken Jesus' mission, and we've made it our own. And how, how do you deal with, so, so again, what's your message to those who are just depressed and down? Really, is it to, to get more religious and to follow Christ? Well, I would certainly not say that it's to get more religious, because quite frankly, the most miserable people I know are some of the most religious. And quite frankly, just to be honest here, some of the the most mean-spirited people are sometimes people that you can meet in church. So hope begins with, you know, there's a scripture in Acts that says that God sent his son to bless you, and everybody wants a blessing, but what is that blessing? Well, it's found in Acts 3.26. It's the blessing of forgiveness. And so the message that we're trying to give people is that there is hope. There is a second opportunity and a third and a fourth, an indefinite opportunity to begin a new life, to have a purpose, to have a definition, to have a meaning. And that starts off with having your sins forgiven and having a relationship with the creator of the universe. And so, no, you know, I wouldn't even call myself a religious person. I mean, of course, you know, we're members of a church, and of course I love the church, but um, I, I would identify myself as a follower of Jesus Christ long before. Matter of fact, people often ask me, what denomination are you? And I'm very reticent to answer that question just because I don't want to get in a debate about theology. I want to, man, I want to explain to people and be able to communicate my own experience of having met Jesus Christ. Gotcha. Uh, I know you focus a lot on, I don't want to use the word marriage counseling, but helping couples get along. Uh, And I know you've been candid uh, about your own relationship with your wife. Um, What's your advice to couples who may be married 10, 15, 20 years who are just not happy thinking about calling it quits? Well, that's a great, I'm glad you asked me that question because I was on the phone with somebody literally an hour ago. And uh, this individual is somebody that loves the Lord. They're very established in business. From They're a very successful um, family man who is going through a marital struggle. And my advice to them was, and quite frankly, I would give this advice to anyone. And I, can, I think I'm qualified to give it because I still do it. Uh, I would say that if you're in a rut in your relationship, it would be a very advantageous thing to go through some Christian counseling. I wouldn't just recommend any, any counseling the counseling that would stem from, obviously, a biblical perspective. Uh, I'm not embarrassed in any way to say that a year ago, my wife and I re-entered marriage counseling and went for three or four months. And I think it's no different than a tune-up in your vehicle. Uh, Your vehicle may not be running at full capacity. I mean, yeah, it's still going, but every now and again, you got to change the spark plugs. you got to change the oil. you got to rotate the tires. Well, why would a marriage be any different? And to have somebody who can independently, from the outside, look at different components that you both could utilize to enhance and grow your relationship, again, from a biblical perspective, I think is great advice, whether you've been married six months or 60 years. That's good advice. Yeah, you seem like a wise guy, uh, a wise man, not wise a wise man, guy. Wise guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, well, that... I am a live guy, and you know, the truth of it is, again, I'm not embarrassed to admit this either. Just because that uh, they say, I don't know, 46, 47% of couples are now staying married. 
But if that means that only half couples are staying married, that doesn't mean that that half that's staying married is living in marital bliss. Many of those couples are going through some very real struggles. Again, and a lot of those struggles can be overcome through a biblical perspective. So um, I I do think that uh, it's something that's very important. And and I think that having an outsider look in and give some practical biblical advice is always a win-win situation. Well, that's good stuff. Uh, how do you build bridges when families go different paths, when a brother's not talking to a sister or the family, the mother's not talking to the son? It seems a lo- there's conflict in a lot of families, either because they're fighting over financially or fighting over different religious things or just there's conflict. That's a, to- that's a hot topic around the holiday time. What's your advice? Well, it is, and for many people, they actually dread getting together with various and sundry family members because of past conflicts. Sometimes that stems from pride. Sometimes that stems from unforgiveness, and sometimes it just stems from some real legitimate disagreements. Um, I'll tell you that I have a family member who has been in the gay lifestyle for years, and initially, my response, I believe, was very inappropriate. I I was very uh, negative. I castigated this individual. Uh, quite frankly, uh, d- just really showed a lot of uh, hypocrisy and Phariseeism. And we spent years separated at the holiday season. And about four years, four or five, about five years ago, um, I reached out and said, listen, I know that you have your convictions, and I know I have mine. I know that, uh, that, that maybe you're not going to change your stand. You obviously know I'm pretty resilient on where I stand. But, hey, let's come together and let's repair this relationship and let's let it begin on Thanksgiving Day. And I can tell you now that, uh, again, there's still a lot of differences of opinion in regards to different lifestyles. But I can tell you this, um, there's a mutual respect. There's a love for one another. And I know that for me to reach a family member or a neighbor or anybody else that I have disagreements with, the only way that I can do that is maintain a connection and communication. And so... Um, getting together the holiday season, there are several steps. As a matter of fact, we just had an article that came out on a national level talking about some ways to resolve some of those deficiencies that come about in the holiday season. That's great. Well, this is a Christmas show, and I have one question I'm going to ask all of our guests today that, that we're honored to have. And uh, I want to know what your favorite Christmas song is, your favorite Christmas movie, and then a Christmas message. Oh, my goodness. My... my um, <laughs> My favorite Christmas song, gosh, I, I still get choked up about it. Um, to this day, I had it the other day. I mean, I, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to admit that, but I uh, was listening to it the other day here in my office, and my eyes started sweating. I wasn't crying, but my eyes were sweating. And uh, But that's uh, Come Let Us Adore Him. Um, you know, I've just never gotten over what it meant at 21 years of age when I met Christ. My favorite Christmas movie, I guess I'd have to pick, I mean, there's so many, but I guess if I had to pick one, um, many of your listeners may not have seen this. It's a movie called Prancer. Uh, are you guys familiar with that? I actually saw it, yeah. Yeah, man, I love it. It's a real, <laughs> it's a real tearjerker. So it's a, it's a great family movie, and it's something you can watch uh, with your kids. And then my Christmas message is, is real simple, because it's the greatest message that has ever been known to man. And that Christmas message is that 2,000 years ago, God Almighty stepped out of the portals of heaven, and he became a man. And he, he entered into the womb of Mary for one single solitary purpose, and that was to reconcile people to his Father. You know, the holiday season, if there's any, if there ever is a time that there should be reconciliation, it should be at the holiday season. And that's really what the holiday is about, what Christmas is about. It's being reconciled to God. And that reconciliation took place because Jesus took our place. When he allowed himself to be beaten with a cat of nine tails, he allowed his arms to be stripped out of joint, the beard to be ripped off his face, nails driven in his hands and feet, a crown of thorns put on his head, so that we could know meaning and forgiveness and eternal life. And then three days later, God Almighty breathed into the lungs of the Son of God, and he stepped out of the tomb. And here, right here, right now, for people that are driving down the road, maybe they're at home listening to your radio show, maybe they're in a situation where they feel like it's hopeless. Maybe Christmas season is a difficult season because of a breakup of a marriage or a wayward son or daughter or or maybe some other problem in their life. 
but I want to tell them that the Christmas message is, is God came to restore. He came to heal. He came to forgive. He came to set free, and he came to put broken lives back together if we'll just give him all the pieces. Jay, that's a fantastic Christmas message. We have to close on that. I personally want to wish you and your family a ver- and all our listeners a very Merry Christmas. It's been great being with you guys today, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. We'll be back in a few minutes. 